On March 7, speaking at the Morgan Stanley Conference, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk shared some latest updates regarding Starship's inaugural orbital test flight. Previously, Musk had stated that the flight test was likely to take place this month, but he has now revised that timeline and stated that SpaceX is targeting April for the mission. But we are getting, we are getting close for our first orbital attempt of, of Starship. Um, hopefully in the next month or so, we'll, we'll have our first attempt. I'm not saying it'll get to orbit, but I am guaranteeing excitement. There appear to be two main reasons for this delay. Firstly, SpaceX is constructing a water deluge system at Starbase to protect the launch pad from the extreme acoustic and thermal environment during tests and launches. Installing the deluge system and building a sufficiently massive water supply will take a few weeks to complete, and SpaceX might want the system to be operational before the flight test. Secondly, the installation of shields on the orbital launch mount is still ongoing. The shields protect all exposed piping, manifolds, control panels, and other components from engine exhaust and debris during liftoff. It may take a few more days to complete the installation. Teams are also installing shields around the booster quick disconnect mechanism, and that work appears to be almost complete. At the Morgan Stanley conference, Musk noted that there is a greater than 50% chance of Starship reaching orbit on the first attempt and an 80% chance of achieving orbit this year. However, he added that it might take a couple more years to achieve full and rapid reusability with Starship. We're building a, a whole series of Starships in, in South Texas. Um, and so I think we've got um, hopefully about an 80% chance of reaching orbit this year. It'll probably take us a couple more years to achieve uh, full and rapid reusability, um, which I can't, I can't emphasize enough is it is, the, it is the profound breakthrough that is needed to extend life beyond Earth. Booster 7 was removed from the orbital launch mount on Friday, March 10. This will help the teams quickly complete the remaining work on the orbital launch mount. Just like I mentioned earlier, the orbital test flight will not take place until the launch mount is completely ready to support the mission. Teams were spotted installing the remaining thermal protection system tile on the nose cone of Ship 24 at the Rocket Garden last week. There are still a few more tiles to be installed. Ship 24 will likely return to the launch site for final preparations only after SpaceX receives an FAA launch license. Floating devices known as buoys, which can be anchored or allowed to drift with ocean currents, are being readied at Starbase for deployment. Buoys spotted at Starbase are CB450 data buoys, which are approved by the U.S. Coast Guard to mark restricted navigation areas around commercial space launches. These devices will inform mariners of non-charted restricted zones during sea-based space launches. Built by Nexon's technologies, CB450s are light enough to be deployed from most small boats. They are equipped with three integrated 15-watt solar panels to provide adequate power and have beacons with a range of 1 to 3 nautical miles. On the day of the launch, a restricted area will be established in the Gulf of Mexico along the rocket's path and around the region where Booster 7 will splash down upon atmospheric re-entry. At the build site, teams have begun moving Raptor engines into the Mega Bay for installation into Super Heavy Booster 9. The booster has already successfully completed three cryogenic proof tests in the past. Once all 33 engines are installed, SpaceX will begin Booster 9's static fire test campaign. Starship 26 was moved out of the high bay Tuesday night to make room for Starship 28 stacking operations. Ship 28's nose cone and payload bay sections were moved into the high bay on Wednesday, March 8. Both sections were stacked on Thursday night. A Starlink dispenser was installed into the payload bay section of Starship 30 on March 4. The dispenser will deploy Starlink satellites into orbit through the payload bay door during Ship 30's orbital mission. On Wednesday night, Starship Nose Cone Pathfinder NC-31 was transported to SpaceX's Massey's test facility, located 7.5 kilometers from Starbase. The Nose Cone was placed inside a dynamic testing structure on Friday morning for structural tests. The Nose Cone is pre-fitted with a hydraulic ram to apply pressure during the test. This simulation replicates the conditions the nose cone will experience at max Q during a real flight. The test result will aid SpaceX in refining the nose cone design for future Starship prototypes. You may recall the lifting jig delivered to Starbase in December for lifting Starships. Until now, Starships were raised and lowered from suborbital launch pads by cranes attached to the lifting points installed on the nose cone. The new jig will connect to the lifting points underneath the forward flaps of ships, allowing teams to eliminate the nose cone lifting points from future prototypes. A load test to evaluate the structural integrity of the new jig was conducted on Wednesday, March 8. The jig will soon be ready to lift the starships. A huge drilling rig was erected near the Mega Bay lately. 
Following the drilling process, several piles were installed at the site, which suggests the possibility of a tall vertical tent being constructed in the near future. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA's maiden launch of its new H-3 rocket, ended in a failure on Tuesday, March 7. The H-3 medium-lift rocket lifted off without a hitch from the Tanegashima spaceport on Tuesday morning carrying Advanced Land Observing Satellite 3, a three-ton Earth imaging satellite planned to become a key tool in disaster management efforts. The rocket's side boosters were jettisoned about two minutes after liftoff, and stage separation took place three minutes later. However, the second stage engine failed to ignite, and the rocket's velocity declined as the altitude reached about 620 kilometers. Fourteen minutes into the flight, mission controllers issued a command to activate the vehicle's flight termination system, after determining there was no chance of completing the mission. Debris from the rocket and the satellite fell over a remote stretch of the ocean a few hundred kilometers east of the Philippines. Tuesday's launch came after an aborted launch attempt on February 17. According to JAXA, the cause of the abort was a fault with the electrical system that supply power to the two first stage engines. The development of the H-3 rocket, built by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries for JAXA, was authorized by the Japanese government in May 2013 to launch a wide variety of commercial satellites. The rocket's first stage uses liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellants, and carries zero, two, or four strap-on solid rocket boosters. The first stage is powered by two or three LE-9 engines, which use an expander bleed cycle. A single LE-9 engine can produce a maximum thrust of 1,471 kilonewtons and has a specific impulse of 425 seconds. Although cheaper than most JAXA engines, the LE-9 engines offer improved safety and increased thrust. The second stage of the H-3 rocket is powered by a single LE-5B3 engine, capable of producing 137 kilonewtons of thrust, with a specific impulse of 448 seconds. It was this hydrogen-fueled engine that failed to ignite during Tuesday's mission. The H-3 stands either 57 or 63 meters, depending on whether it's flying with a short or long payload fairing. The rocket can deliver more than 4,000 kilograms into a 500 kilometers sun-synchronous orbit and more than 6,500 kilograms into a geostationary transfer orbit. California-based Relativity Space postponed the planned debut launch of its 3D-printed Terran-1 rocket on March 8 over fuel temperature concerns. The next launch attempt will be on March 11 during a three-hour window that opens at 6 p.m. UTC. Relativity Space was founded in 2016 by Tim Ellis and Jordan Nowan. The company's Terran-1 rocket is a two-stage fully expendable small-lift launch vehicle capable of delivering up to 1,250 kg to low Earth orbit and up to 900 kg to a sun-synchronous orbit. The launch vehicle stands 35.2 meters high, with nine Eon engines powering the first stage and one vacuum-optimized Eon engine powering the upper stage. Relativity says that its first Terran-1 rocket is 85% 3D printed and hopes to increase that proportion to 95% in the future. The company believes its approach will make building orbital-class rockets much faster than traditional methods. The 3D-printed Eon engines use liquid oxygen and liquid methane as propellants in a gas generator cycle. The engine produces approximately 102 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level and 126 kilonewtons in a vacuum. Saturday's planned debut launch of Terran-1, dubbed Good Luck, Have Fun, will carry a small aluminum alloy ring into orbit, rather than a functional payload. This dummy payload was one of the first metal 3D prints Relativity made using its first generation of 3D printers. The rocket will lift off from Launch Complex 16, a launch pad at the U.S. Space Forces facility in Cape Canaveral. Terran-1 will experience the greatest amount of aerodynamic forces 1 minute and 20 seconds after liftoff as it climbs through the atmosphere. Relativity has stated that passing this point of the flight will prove the structural integrity of the 3D printed rocket under the most extreme conditions it is expected to encounter during flight. Separation of the first and second stages is expected to occur approximately 2 minutes and 45 seconds after liftoff. And approximately 8 minutes after launch, Terran-1 will make history as the first 3D-printed and the first methane-fueled rocket to successfully reach orbit. NASA and SpaceX are preparing to bring the Crew-5 astronauts home from the International Space Station. Crew-5 mission launched on 5 October 2022 carried NASA astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh Kasada, cosmonaut Anna Kakina, and Japan's Koichi Wakata to the space station. Anna Kakina was the first Russian to ride a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. During their six-month stay aboard the orbiting laboratory, the crew performed more than 200 scientific experiments aimed to improve life on Earth and prepare for human travel beyond low Earth orbit. 
For example, they did studies on printing human organs in space, understanding fuel systems operating on the moon, advancing research in heart disease, and fluid behavior in microgravity. If the landing zone weather conditions are favorable, Crew Dragon Endurance carrying the Crew-5 astronauts will undock from the space station's Harmony module at 7.05 a.m. UTC on March 11. Several hours later, multiple departure phasing burns will put the Crew Dragon on the proper orbital path to line it up with the splashdown zone. Shortly before the final deorbit burn, Crew Dragon will separate from its trunk, which will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. The spacecraft then executes the deorbit burn, which commits it to return and places it in an orbit with the proper trajectory for splashdown. The spacecraft would be traveling at more than 28,100 km per hour during re-entry, and the maximum temperature it will experience will be more than 1,900 degrees Celsius. Once the spacecraft enters the Earth's atmosphere, two sets of drogue parachutes will be deployed, followed by four main parachutes. The spacecraft will splash down in the Atlantic Ocean at 2.19 a.m. UTC on March 12 after a 19-hour voyage. SpaceX teams will be on location to recover the capsule from the water. SpaceX launched 41 web internet satellites into space from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on March 9 in its third and final dedicated mission for the British broadband operator. The rocket's first stage came back to Earth and touched down on a landing pad at Cape Canaveral about 7 minutes and 50 seconds after launch, marking the booster's 13th successful landing. The rocket's upper stage, meanwhile, continued its journey and eventually deployed all 40 satellites in small batches, beginning about 59 minutes after liftoff. Once complete, the OneWeb constellation will be made up of 36 satellites in each of the 18 orbital planes. 600 of these satellites are needed for global coverage, with an additional 48 on-orbit spares. Thursday's mission brought the number of satellites in this network to 582. An additional 36 satellites are due to launch this month from India aboard a geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle Mark III rocket. The majority of OneWeb satellites have been launched atop Russian-built Soyuz rockets, but Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year ended that arrangement, and OneWeb had to find other rides to orbit. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, so you never miss an episode.